Welcome to another Zoom. Let me give you the I love you sign. We have Dr. David Anderson. Continue. Hello. He said hello. Yeah. That means, that means he's. <laughs> I didn't know if I was on the screen or not yet. So I he said, I don't know what they're looking at. So yeah. he said hello. And, he, and I could hear him all the way from Sarasota. Can you believe this? <laughs> he's sitting in his office. In Sarasota, you're going to make me a video someday, right, Dave? Yes, I have call. somebody on that, even as we speak. So hopefully, by the next time we okay, tape, I will have you a little um with, what, with what the entire like campus, a B roll right? in the industry with the entire campus, entire campus. Okay, and and he has he has a a distinct cross that was made specifically for Faith Baptist. It's one of my favorite. And it sits in, in the auditorium, but it's huge. Uh, and it's uh, you'll see all of that. But I, that's what I've been asking for for, I think, three or four years, whatever. I'm just kidding. But, uh, <laughs> but I, he's going to do it. Uh, we're going to study today Philippians, right? Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 19. Let's continue. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at, your, at last your care for me has flourished again, Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Now, this is an interesting um, insight into Paul's relationship with the Philippians because they were a church that he planted. And you remember the story, it involved the Philippian jailer. Yeah. Paul and Silas had gone there to preach, had been arrested. They were put in jail. They were put in stocks and bonds, which is a, a, the the worst dungeon part of the Roman prison. And it's not like prisons today. You know, this is a dark, dungy, mangy, probably rat infested little hell hole type of place. Yet Paul and Silas sing praises to God. And the, the Bible doesn't say they ask God to get them out of prison. They're just praising God that they were worthy to be considered worthy of persecution, that they had called to God, saved to God, they're praising God, but then the prison shakes, all the prison doors open, and Paul and Silas, they don't run out, which shows you their prayer, the praying wasn't about escaping, or they would have just bolted for the doors. Sure. They stayed there. So when the guard responded with fear, because it would be the death penalty for him to lose the prisoners. He he comes to them in fear, and Paul says, don't worry, we're all still here. Because it wasn't about escape. It was about uh, praising God. Well, through that, uh, they are released. The church in Philippi is founded. Paul then goes off on more missionary journeys, and he's writing back to them. But they have kept a relationship with him because of their appreciation for his role in their life. And it involved supporting his ministry, but they hadn't been able to do it for a while. So Paul is saying, I rejoiced in the Lord that now your care for me has been renewed. It's coming. You're, you're sending money and helpers to help me once again. And then he said, I know you always cared, but you lacked opportunity. This is a good indication of the mind of a true servant of God. They do not feel entitled to the support of other people. They do not resent and get bitter and cut people off for not supporting them. They understand that everybody in life has their own issues, their own life, their own concerns. And he simply said, I am grateful you're supporting me again, but I understand why you couldn't because you just didn't have the opportunity. And that there's no lingering bitterness there's no passive aggressive snarkyism. There's no, well, it's about time, and I'm glad you finally got on board. It's just joy. I thank God that you're able to give, but I thank God for you when you weren't able to give. And that's the really the, the free spirit of a joyful person, because a joyful person assumes that other people have the best intentions. How could he be joyful knowing he had the death sentence? Because he knew where the death sentence would lead him. You know, he in Philippians, he talks about the struggle he had. I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, but to be with you, I know, is far more meaningful or necessary for the advance of the gospel. How was he eventually killed? Beheaded. 
what church history. Now, it doesn't tell us in scripture, church history tells us he was beheaded. And it was after his imprisonment in Rome where he was let out and then rearrested about 64, 65 AD. And he was beheaded because he was a Roman citizen. If he was not a Roman citizen, he would have been crucified as Peter was. So because he was a Roman citizen, Rome did not crucify its citizens. So he was beheaded, which was considered an honorable act, an honorable way so, to die. So Paul knew that was coming. Yes, he knew it was coming. Beheaded. And he knew that, yes, he knew if, if Rome was going to kill him, it would be beheading. But he could have been killed a number of times in his life. God spared him from death, from being stoned, from shipwrecks, Paul said, from wild beasts, and from robbers, highwaymen out in his travels. His life was always at risk. But it reminds me of something Dr. Falwell said back when I was at Liberty as a student. Jerry said that he is invincible until God wants to take him home. So it wasn't, I personally can't die, but I believe in God's sovereign plan for my life so much that I know I cannot die until God wants to take me home. That's the way Paul felt and believed, that God would sustain him until he had finished his race and he had run the course, as he told Timothy. And so he believed God would sustain him, although he personally wanted to go ahead and go to heaven. But he knew there was still work to be done. So that, that attitude is what caused him to respond with such grace when people supported him or when they couldn't, or even when they opposed him. So that brings us to verse 11. He puts it in perspective. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. And that word need, uh, in, need in Greek is hustetasin, and it means destitution. It means poverty or want. This is not he needs a tank of gas. This is not he needs a meal. <laughs> this is not he needs a place to stay, to stay for the night. He's saying, when I'm speaking about your support for me, you Philippians, I'm not speaking in regard to the poverty that I've endured. I, that's irrelevant. I have learned to be content in whatever my physical state is. Now, that is a, a level of spiritual understanding that you and I ascribe to or aspire to. Um, we might think that's possible and we want to get there, but it's a very difficult place to arrive at in life. And you get there incrementally. And one way you don't get there is by what you and I all do, everybody who's watching, we get angry when somebody cuts us off on the road. We get upset when our food doesn't get to our table fast enough. We get upset and angry at the slightest provocations that will never get us to the point where we can say, I am content in whatever state I am. And to be content means to be satisfied. It means to be unagitated. And it means to be at peace. So contentment is great gain for a believer and just like we talked about last week, that most believers, including you and I, at different phases in our life, we, we don't have peace. We live with anxiety. We also don't have much contentment. Uh, modern believers, I wouldn't say contentment is one of the things that marks the American Christian. We are a very discontented people, and I include myself in that. I strive for contentment. I remind myself I am to be content. And when I'm walking with the Lord and practicing the principles that Paul lays out in Philippians, I really am content. But it doesn't take much to get me off that path. Yeah. It doesn't take me much to, to not apply the principles of Philippians. That's why it's a, it's a conscious, daily, deliberate focus of the believer. God doesn't just hit you with joy. And because you prayed for it one time, or somebody laid hands on you, or something miraculous happened, where you have joy from that point on the rest of your life. Joy is the result of a every single day 
of fertilization, nurturing, and harvesting of the fruit of joy that the Holy Spirit puts in our lives that transcends whether we have what we want or not. And that's what Paul's talking about. You know, with a billion people, probably more than that, on this planet, billions, when you think of God knows every detail of your life and my life. Yes. How, How can you fathom that? Oh, well, you can't. That's where faith comes in. You know, just accepting that God exists. You can never prove it. That requires faith. Uh, accepting how big God is, that he can make all the galaxies and the universe. You can't explain that. That That is just requires faith. So the Christian life comes down to a faith that allows us to, to establish a worldview that puts us not in the center, but in the orbit. Christ is the center, and we orbit around him. Most of us live our lives with us as the sun, and everything else orbits around us, and we try to put Christ in there and our church life and religion, but we are we remain the center. We will never be content as long as we are the center of things. You know, that's why men are always more fulfilled when they have a purpose, when they're serving something greater than themselves. Many men find their their first moment of real true maturity is when they have a child and they realize okay, my life is now about that child's welfare, not my own. Mm -hmm. So marriage does that a bit, but marriage has its gratifying moments where there's a selfishness to marrying somebody. But when you have a child, it's a love you haven't known before. It's a selfless love where you realize, I really do think these people are more important than me. I want to live for their welfare. Well, that's, that's a purpose so when men, whether it's patriotism or science or knowledge or the, their art or relationship, we need something bigger than ourselves to really have contentment and fulfillment. Just living for self leaves you empty. That's why so many billionaires or millionaires, people who have everything the world has to offer, are so unhappy and commit suicide and get divorced and have miserable lives, not all of them, but there are many people who do, because that doesn't really fill you. You have to have purpose. I know you can relate to this, Dave, because you've been in the ministry for a long time, but people will ask me, how have you remained, especially doing television, interviewing thousands of people uh, in in 42 years, and how, how how have you focused this long? And, and I really mean this. It's not a, it's not a cliche. My focus has always been on him. And the reason he called me to do this, that's my focus. And and I wake up, literally, this is the truth, because, I mean, I have nothing to offer. I mean, I got zero talent, singing, playing, nothing. I got zero talent. But the Lord used this zero guy and put himself in there and took me and made something out of literally nothing. And when I wake up, I realize without him, I can do nothing. Right. And so he's the purpose. And it's true for everybody. Even those who are watching are those who we watch on Christian television or in the Christian industry of, inter- of entertainment or ministry. Even the highest of all the believers with the most talent, the most skills, the most ability, they're nothing in the sight of God. <laughs> it's God's power in us that accomplishes his will to the point that Paul said to the Corinthians, God doesn't choose the mighty. God doesn't choose the wise. He chooses the weak and the foolish and the things that aren't to confound the things that are uh, the pride of the world. And so we all fit into that category, whether we realize it or not. You know, David, when you, when you said confound, I remember back... I used, yeah, as you know, Super 60s was the leading one in the nation. We had thousands of senior adults coming, and and it was it started with just a little core of people, and it was packed one day. And the guy that I went to college with, he was very smart. I mean, li- literally in the genius area. He comes up to me because the place was packed. All the seniors were pulling at me, and I'm hugging them. And and he and he looks at me right in the eyes, and he goes, "Why you?" And I said. <laughs> Why me? 
He said, yeah, why you? Meaning all of the people, because he knew, he knew when I was in college, nothing. And I said, it has to be God. And I have felt that to this day yeah. because I'm going, God makes no mistakes. He's perfect. So if, if I knew he made a mistake, this would be the mistake. <laughs> but he doesn't make a mistake. Everything we do and everything you that are watching, if you just give him. I remember me saying I'm available. And he took that those words, I'm available. And here's 42 years later. Right. That's why Paul says in Romans 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Yes. So whatever it is that you are, give it to God. And he will do amazing things. Even if you never know, he's done amazing things. Yeah. Even if you never actually see the fruit of it, God will accomplish his will through a surrendered servant. And his will is amazing. Even if it's only bringing one person to Christ, you never know who that one person might be. But if it's God's will, it's just as important as what any superstar Christian celebrity does. Yeah. If you're doing the will of the master, that is incredibly important. Amen. And he has that for every one of us. We Amen. can all be servants of God. So Paul wants to expound on that, whatever state I am, I've learned to be content. And the key word there is the word learned, which means it's a mental process of assessing what's going on and what's really important and how should I respond to it, which is what Philippians is all about, the mindset of joy. He learned how to be content. God didn't give him contentment. He learned it. So this is what he says in verse 12. I know this is the same word from Gnosko. I, I have a deep experiential knowledge. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So that reads really good in English, but in Greek, there's some, there's some, expansion of those words that, that sort of add to its import. The word abased means to be brought low, humiliated. Wow. So Paul said, I've learned how to be joyful when humiliated. The word hungry means to be extremely famished. So Paul had learned how to be joyful when he's deprived of food to the point that he's starving. And that word to suffer need means to be completely deficient. So Paul had learned how to be joyful in the midst of great need and deficiency. So when Paul said, I've learned in whatever state I am, he then describes the extremity of that, of the extreme nature of that state he's talking about. And oftentimes when I counsel people and they're going through a very hard time, they will say to me, oh, pastor, you don't know what it feels like. And they, and they have no idea of what my life is. They just assume yeah. if you're a pastor, you've sort of lived a, a garden path life. Yes. You've lived in the ease. Everything always goes your way. You're one of God's favorites. They have no idea. And I don't counter it with that. But, you know, it's interesting how often it comes up. Paul takes that argument away by telling them, let me tell you what state I've been in. I've been humiliated I've been famished, starving for food, yeah. and I've been completely deficient of any needs that I have. But in that, I abound and I'm full of joy, the blessings of God. So that's a state that we often, we want to have the, the supernatural gifts. You know, we want to, I'm not saying you and me, but believers, want, we want to speak in tongues. We want to have, be able to heal people. We want to be able to do miracles. We want to have great faith where we can speak things into existence. Why doesn't anybody ever talk about, I want the gift of contentment. I want to learn contentment. <laughs> that just, it has no excitement to it. There's Sounds no boring. appeal to the flesh, but it appeals to the spirit because contentment is a godly trait of spiritual maturity. And contentment will follow you as you, if you go into the hut or if you go into the mansion. Uh, contentment follows you if you're out on the athletic field in your greatest sports moment, or it will follow you into the hospital when you're dying of a disease. Wow. Contentment goes with you everywhere. Paul said, I have it. So verse 13 is one of those misquoted, misunderstood 
misapplied famous verses. It's because we, we, don't, we don't read the context, do we? No, we don't read the context. We just like to pull verses out that apply to what we want for the day. This is on T-shirts. It's on plaques in the house. And all that's fine because it's a great verse. But it you know, you know I, love, I love the MMA fighters. And John Jones has Philippians 4.13 across his chest tattooed. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, if I was facing him in an alley, whatever he thinks that verse means, I'll say, yes, it does. I'll accept it. Yeah, I'm not going to argue with him about that. But in context, what verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Contextually, that makes sense if you read it this way. I can do all these things through Christ who strengthens me. He's talking about joy and contentment regardless of the external circumstance. He said, I have learned to be content and I can be content and I can rejoice whether my needs are being met or not because Christ strengthens me. He's not saying he can accomplish any task. He's not saying I can achieve any goal. He's not saying I can express any ambition of my heart and have success in it. That's not what that verse means. It means that I can fulfill the Christ likeness that God wants for me, I can do that because Christ is in me. But there's nothing wrong with with repeating that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me at that pressure moment, is there? Well, if you're saying it as an expression, I'm dependent on Christ to give me the power not to succeed, but to have the right attitude and to be Christ-like right. in the endeavor. Yeah, That's what the promise means. So sometimes quoting scripture inaccurately can be can lead you to a falsehood. Because if you believe, I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me, which means I can beat this foe, I can achieve this goal, and you fail? Yeah. What does that do to your faith? Yeah. What does that do to your theology? Well, you, you can't blame God, so the problem must be me. Therefore, I got to crank up more faith. Or I've, and then self-condemnation and doubt and skepticism comes in, or just literally futile frustration where you keep trying to improve yourself, thinking if you get better, you will be able to apply this verse. It's better to realize that God's passion for us is to have Christ likeness and all the endeavors of life, whether we succeed or fail, is irrelevant. Five minutes. It's to have Christ likeness because Christ likeness is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self control. It's the Beatitudes that Paul and that Jesus describes in the Sermon on the Mount. It is what Paul talks about, or the writer of Hebrews, in that great chapter 11, the Hall of Faith. Some of them, he said, were sawn in half. Wow. They were tortured. They lived in caves. That's not success by our standards today. <laughs> they, had, they had no food. They had no freedom, but they're included in the hall of faith because they had Christ's likeness in every situation they're in. That's what verse 13 really means. So verse uh, 16, for even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. So Paul did not receive the Philippians' gifts to enrich himself, although it supplied his needs, he genuinely wanted those gifts for their benefit because of what it would do for them. Now, that is often the calling card of Christian leaders who ask for money. Uh, I want you to give it so that God will enrich you. And that's a beautiful statement if it's real, if it's genuine, if it's sincere. But I'd say for very few Christians, is that real? For Paul, it was. He said, I don't desire uh, richness. I desire fruit that will go to your account yeah. because you're being Christ-like in your giving as I carry out the gospel. For instance, Paul did not have the finest vehicle to travel to towns with. <laughs> he didn't have the finest clothes. He didn't stay in the five-star hotel. He stunk. The money that came to him, it went towards him right. expanding his outreach of ministry. Most of us can't say that phrase 100% genuinely because we do enrich ourselves off the generosity of others, but, but not Paul. How can, how can we say for me to live as Christ, to die is gain? 
that's a perspective that's a perspective um it's it's one that says that i'm living for the purposes of christ not for my own benefit so if i die and that's god's plan that's his purposes if i live that means god's controlling whether i keep living that should be for god's purposes as well so it's an attitude you and i are to have so that brings into verse 18 he said and indeed i have all and I bound it means I have everything you sent. I have now received it. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things sent from you. And then here's that beautiful description of the way the Lord looks at a Christian being generous towards another Christian. A sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. So with the metaphor of an Old Testament sacrifice of praise and worship and thanks and even repentance to God at the altar, Paul is saying that Philippians' faithful generosity to him was a God-pleasing act of worship. And that was Paul's desire for them. Not that he would get some more stuff, because he loved them even when they weren't giving. It was that when you're able to give, yeah. you're actually pleasing the Lord by being generous to another believer. And that is a wonderful promise for you and me. But how can we do that? If we give all of our stuff away, how are we going to survive? Well, Paul answers that in the next verse. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Wow. So he's telling the Philippians, whatever you need, your, your need for for physical provision, joy, contentment, sustenance, faith, hope. God has got an infinite supply. He'll give you everything you need. But if you focus on the needs of others and give what you have, you'll never outgive the graciousness and the benevolence of God. So when we give our lives to God, some people are afraid that, well, he'll send me to Africa as a missionary. Well, if he does, that's a beautiful thing. But if you give your lives to God, he will take your life, give you contentment, joy, peace, and then go with you wherever you go in life, serving him. You have no reason to fear. Surrender your life to Christ. That is for you. You needed that suggestion today. Give yourself to him. He gave all to you when they hung him on that cross and he bled to death and gave his life for you. God bless. Bye-bye.